title. Um, it's a very broad subject and very multidisciplinary, and, and consequently, I have a number of, of colleagues that have helped me with this, including colleagues in, in Kenya, here in the center, and in, uh, in Sweden as well. So here's an outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'm gonna first go over some of the key drivers of overfishing on coral reefs, particularly in developing countries. I'd then like to introduce this concept of a social ecological trap, which is when there's synergies between social and ecological processes that drive the system towards an undesirable state. I'll then briefly go over some of the key tools for sustaining coral reef fisheries. Millions of people depend on the beauty and bounty of coral reefs for income and subsistence livelihoods, but around the world, the ecosystem goods and services provided by reefs are being degraded from overfishing. It's generally held that human use driven primarily by population density is the principal cause of coral reef degradation. But little is known about how other socioeconomic factors such as development shape society's impacts on coral reefs. In a recent paper, we tried to shed some light on this by examining the relative roles of human population density, habitat quality, and socioeconomic development in structuring reef fish biomass, which is a variable that's highly sensitive to management and human use. We looked at 19 fish sites across Kenya, Tanzania, Madagascar, Seychelles, and Mauritius, which represents an incredible spectrum of socioeconomic development and population densities. Consistent with a number of stu other studies, we found that human population density did have a significant but somewhat weak relationship to reef fish biomass. We also found that, that the, the structural complexity of the reef also had a significant relationship, and we can see two examples here, uh, both of reefs with low coral cover, but the one on top has got high structural complexity, and on the bottom, it's got low structural complexity, which basically means there's few places for critters to hide. We also examined a multivariate index of socioeconomic, of community level socioeconomic development, which was based on the presence or absence of 16 community level infrastructure items, things such as hospitals, schools, roads, and electricity. Interestingly, the strongest relationship we found with reef fish biomass was the quadratic function of the socioeconomic development index. Thus, where development was very low or very high, fish biomass was high, but biomass was low where development was intermediate. Fish biomass at the bottom of this curve was about one quarter of that of, of the biomass at the high and low development sites. Now we tested candidate models with all possible combinations of these three predictor variables to determine the best possible combination or the best possible model for determining reef fish biomass. We used country as a random effect to control for the non-independence of samples within country. A key and surprising finding from this study was that the best model to predict fish biomass included the structural complexity of the reef and the quadratic function of the socioeconomic development index, but did not include human population density. Now that doesn't mean that human, humans have no impact on the environment or human population has no impact on the environment, but when you account for socioeconomic development and habitat quality, no additional variance gets explained by human population density. Now, these findings are broadly consistent with the environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis, which predicts that increasing economic development will lead to resource degradation until a point when societies become sufficiently affluent and begin to demand environmental quality. Then further economic growth will lead to improved environmental conditions. Now, the, the causal mechanisms behind the, the Kuznets curve can be broadly grouped into four categories. These include the technique effect, whereby the tools that societies use to produce goods and services can change with differing levels of impact on the environment. The composition effect, whereby the composition of the economy can change to be less destructive to the local environment. For example, by switching from primary resource extraction to a service industry. There's also the scale effect, whereby wealthier societies are able to displace local impacts and gather resources from further afield, often in areas that are poorer or less regulated. There's also a parallel sociological theory of ecological modernization, which suggests that it's not economic development per se that leads to changing environmental conditions, but rather uh, accompanying institutional changes, such as investments in scientific and management organizations. So we use socioeconomic survey data from these communities to examine how a combination of the technique, scale, and composition effects, and also local common property institutions may be playing a role in our observation of a Cousins-like relationship for coral reef fishes. In low development sites, technological constraints and local institutions were 
limiting people's capacity to exploit resources. In middle development sites, um, societies have the technology to plunder the reefs, but not the institutions to protect them. High development sites were characterized by uh, high levels of involvement in the economic sector, the formal economic sector, things such as salaried employment, high use of more benign gears such as hand lines, and the use of boats with engines, which allowed for fishing further afield. Now, in places such as East Africa, where persistent poverty is coupled with resource degradation, improving human welfare is going to be a critical component of sustaining coral reef seascapes. But efforts to improve human welfare in a reef governance context will probably be ineffective and sometimes even counterproductive unless they're coupled with effective policies and good governance for two key reasons. First, aspects of economic growth can contribute to larger scale problems confronting coral reef systems. In particular, wealthier societies are able to, able to extract resources from further afield, and this can contribute to this idea of roving bandits. Also, they contribute, they contribute increasingly to the larger scale problems confronting coral reefs, things such as climate change. So for example, the per capita emissions of an Australian is over 100 times that of a Malagasy, that's someone from Madagascar. Secondly, assumptions that economic conditions will improve with economic growth does not account for potentially irreversible changes in coral reef ecosystems. And this irreversible change can happen as a result of heavy degradation at the bottom of this curve. In a worst case scenario, the system may flip into an alternate state and uh, ecological conditions won't be able to improve with further economic growth. And with this, I'd like to introduce this concept of a social ecological trap, which is when there's synergies between social and ecological processes that may lead the system towards this alternate undesirable state that's very difficult to, uh, to come back to. And let's go over a couple of these potential synergies as they relate to the, the fisheries in, in my study sites. Artisanal fishers use a range of gears, each of which targets specific sizes and species of fish. Well, we group data from landing surveys into functional groups based on fish feeding characteristics. We paid particular attention to feeding activities thought to play a critical role in the resilience of coral reefs, such as herbivory and predation on sea urchins. And those are indicated in red. And what's clear is that the gears used predominantly in the low and intermediate development sites are targeting a very high proportion of these key species. Fishing activities in these areas may be severely eroding the resilience of the, of the social ecological system here, and these negative feedbacks may be moving the system towards a state that sustains fewer fish. So the critical question then is, if this is a social ecological problem, how then will people respond to this, uh, the, the, these fewer fish? And we began to explore this by asking fishers what they caught on a good day, a bad day and an average day. And we found that there was, when we checked this with fi fisheries landings data, we found very, very good correspondence there. We then asked fishers what they would do in response to long-term decline scenarios of 10%, 20%, 30%, and 50%. And what's very clear is the proportion of fishers that would exit the fishery would increase during the scenario from about 4%, and that's the, the top bit on the, the green bit on the top there, to over 30% in a 50% decline scenario. Of the fishers that would remain in the fishery, more than half would adapt the gear that they use. But the devil's often in the details, so let's take a little bit more detailed look at, at what these particular responses would entail. Fishers that said they would change gear would mostly switch to reef-related occupations. They would most, mostly stay within reef-related occupations, and this would include changing to hand lines, uh, switching to octopus and sea cucumbers, changing the vessels. Now, this didn't mean they'd go buy a, a brand new boat. It typically was a crew member who would try their luck with a different captain or a different crew. They would do trap fisheries, and I think importantly, they'd be more inclined to fish illegally. So if conditions got bad, they're much more likely to poach inside protected areas or use illegal gear. Fishers that would fish harder would fish an average of about 50% harder, and critically, this would often be achieved by adding gear. So fishers that had 100 meters of net would add 50 meters of net. Fishers that had 10 traps would add an additional five traps. Fishers that would move location would move an average of about 90 kilometers. Now, depending on the, seasca the size of the seascape that you're concerned with, this could either be great in somebody else's problem or it could just be a movement of effort within uh, the, the area that you're managing. 
Now, critically, those that would reduce effort would do so through occupational mobility. So this would be done by switching temporarily to the informal economic sector or the agricultural sector, but respondents were very clear that this would be done in a time frame of months, and they would do so with one eye on the fishery, right? So the critical point, well, there's two critical points here. The first is that if we can assume a 50% reduction in catch relates to a 50% reduction in abundance, that means there's about 140% of the effort per fish originally. But also critically, there's additional latent energy or latent effort in the fishery because the fishers that would add effort would do so by adding gear and this gear is going to be permanently in the fishery. But the fishers that would remove effort would do so but come back in. So we see a ratcheting down. People's response would be to ratchet down in the fishery. Now it's also important to look at this from, from a linked social ecological perspective. And from the social perspective, we would look at this capacity to adapt as being a very positive thing. And when we look at social resilience and adaptive capacity, this capacity to formulate response strategies and to adapt is critical. But when we look at this from a social ecological perspective, we might realize that certain adaptations may undermine the resilience of the social ecological system. In particular, changing gear, fishing harder, and moving locations are reinforcing feedbacks, right? These would extenuate negative trends in the ecosystem, perhaps at a different scale or a different space, but they would, uh, they would uh, extenuate these negative trends. Whereas reducing effort and stopping fishing create damping feedbacks where negative trends in the ecosystems are mitigated by decreased fishing effort. What's critically important here is of the fishers that would respond, that would use a damping adaptation or a damping response by a 50% decline scenario, 50% of them would first try a reinforcing response. So the idea here is that people are more inclined to dig deeper into a social ecological trap before they try to escape it. Again, from a social resilience point of view, it's very important that fishers foresee that they could adapt, that they have this latent adaptive capacity. But the type of adaptive, uh, adaptive capacity they possess is such that it can erode the, resi the resilience of the wider social ecological system. It's also critical to understand what are the socioeconomic characteristics of fishers that would employ different responses. We used a binary logistic regression to see whether we could predict a fisher's response based on their socioeconomic characteristics. And what we can see plotted here is that the probability of exiting the fishery uh, can be mapped as a function of people's uh, household wealth and their occupational multiplicity. That's the number of occupations that a household has. What this really says is that poorer people are the ones that would remain in the fishery. And critically, um, this is consistent with a broad body of literature in both economics and resilience on poverty traps, which is when poorer people ha don't have the ability to mobilize the necessary resources to overcome either chronic low-income situations or shocks to the system. And as a result, they remain in poverty. Now, in our situation, Poorer fishers in this context were also the ones to be more likely to use destructive nets such as beach sand fishing. So the consequences of staying in this poverty trap were that you were digging deeper into the social ecological trap. So I think this is really critical in how we contextualize overfishing. And I think it's very clear that we don't want to be in one of these social ecological traps from either an ecological perspective or a social perspective. And I think this should really help us recontextualize how we confront overfishing. Rather than, rather than being worried about what percentage of the ocean we designate off limits to human use, we also need to be concerned with how far away from these types of social ecological traps we are. Now, policy tools are going to be critical in helping us avoid and overcome these social ecological traps. Now, here's a, uh, uh, another graph of this Kuznets curve, and we can see it down on the bottom there but it's much less pronounced because we've also included protected areas in the region. And we can see there's a, a very big difference between the fished areas, even the best fished areas, and the protected areas. In fact, there's about a 15, 16 fold difference between one of the protected areas and its control sites there. So these areas may in fact help build local ecological resilience and, and prevent phase shifts quite locally. But within this region, protected areas are very, very small, the largest of which is about six square kilometers. There are also very few. We probably have the majority of protected areas in the region plotted on this graph, 
and they're also very far in between. So there's a need to foster resilience throughout the broader seascape and not just within protected areas. So I think we need to be developing policy tools that address these critical drivers of overfishing, that address elements of the technique effect, that address elements of the scale effect, that, that strengthen institutions, um, and that address this, this idea of a composition effect. And there are these tools uh, available, and I'd like to go over a couple of, of quick examples of them. You can see here about a 40% decline in five years in the catch, and this is from, this is from a couple of landing sites in Kenya. To put this into context, that's $2 a day, and that's a dollar a day. It's hard to get by on $2 a day in Kenya. In 2000 and 2001, uh, several local landing sites decided to start enforcing national legislation that had been in place for a while, restricting beach seine nets. And we can see there was a dramatic decline or a dramatic turnaround in this declining stocks where these were done. And we've now put in a, a control site there where uh, beach seine nets weren't restricted. And it's gone from about $2 a day to $4 a day. We can still say that catch rates sort of suck there, but the difference between $2 a day and $4 a day is, is quite substantial. In addressing the scale effect, I think property rights are going to be a critical element of this, because this is going to help prevent this idea of roving bandits. And throughout the Pacific, th there are many property rights institutions, but we're also seeing these being developed in small-scale fisheries throughout the world. And perhaps one of the most poignant examples, one of the best examples, comes from some work a colleague of mine has been doing in Chile. In the mid-1990s in Chile, the government developed delineated property rights for artisanal fisher organizations. There's now about 550 of these property rights systems, and they're covering about 1,000 square kilometers. Now, these were designed primarily for benthic resources, in particular a small snail called loco, but they've had add-on benefits throughout the wider, um, the wider system, particularly for uh, nearshore fishes. And we can see here that the density of fishes uh, for these uh, particularly key uh, fishery species are much higher in the property rights areas, which are in the black bars, compared to the open access areas. And we can also see from this multivariate plot that there's quite different assemblages in these property rights areas compared to these open access areas, even though they weren't designed for these species at all. What's important is we're starting to see the emergence of these property rights systems in other areas as well. And particularly in Kenya, we're starting to see the emergence of these uh, what we call beach management units. And here, local landing sites are now able to develop rules and regulations appropriate for their site. And one of the things that they're able to do is exclude outside fishers, and this is really critical. Now, some of these are working really well, and we've seen great examples of these property rights systems being developed where now they're developing protected areas, now they're developing, they're excluding bad gears and excluding outside fishers. Because of the way things work in Kenya, we're also seeing some areas that are being developed where they're actually encouraging outside fishermen in because people are able to tax outside fishers and uh, essentially they're now encouraging them to come in. This happens with, with the critical role of leadership in there and, and the lack of capacity because there's a, a minimum education limit to become a chairman of one of these beach management units. None of the fishermen there can meet this, so they have to get somebody else who doesn't really care about the fishery in there. So there are some elements of this institution that, that isn't perfect yet, but it's a trial. And we have a very large project, which we're meeting in La Reunion next week to bring together, where we're looking at the success of this system. Uh, we've got about 50 sites in, in five countries, and we're looking at the success of these types of systems. So to wrap it up, I, I think there's a couple of key points here. One is that we, we do understand the role of, of humans in population density, and, and it, this has been pretty well established. But it's also critical to understand the role of drivers uh, of other drivers such as markets and socioeconomic development. We're also going to need a multi-pronged approach to, to get through these social ecological traps and to avoid these social ecological traps. And there is no panacea, there is no recipe that needs to be put in everywhere. But I imagine that elements of protected areas, that elements of property rights, elements of strengthening institutions, and, and policies to break poverty traps and break these reinforcing adaptations are going to be critical. I think the key future direction, the key challenge that we're going to have is how can we improve human welfare without degrading our resource base? And this really speaks to this idea of the scale effect. How can we, how can we put policies into place so that our problems 
our, our solutions at one scale don't become our problems at a different scale. So with that, I'd just like to say thanks. <laughs>